We are recording. <laughs> Golden moment time. Here Golden we go. moment! <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what are you going to be talking about today? Um, today I'll be talking about how uh, animation actually really influences gameplay and how um, gameplay can be leveraged by really good animation work. Um, and I'll illustrate this using uh, player navigation and really break down how to make a player navigation clip and illustrate some of the cool scripts and some of the cool workflow practices that I have that could speed up your workflow or and give you some new ideas and new ways to animate. Good. So if you're going to be here at the show, you're going to get a real good view of, of the presentation, of the special presentation, where I'll be talking about um, Destiny Animation Retrospective. Um, and it's going to showcase a lot of awesome behind-the-scenes footage, some great stories, and essentially it's going to show you how we made a new IT from scratch on the animation front. Wow. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it sounds exciting. So before I get into my Maya demo, um, feel free to live stream again if you'd like. Um, I wanted to take a moment to show, your anim uh, to show you our animation rigs at Bungie. Um, our tools were created by an outstanding team of riggers and technical artists who all believe in a modular workflow, and I'll explain that in a moment. Though the visuals of my workflow may seem low-tech for this demonstration, the principles I'll be demonstrating here directly correlate to how we work at Bungie. So I'm not going to show you these cool tools, um, but just know that these cool tools and what I'm going to show you with my crappy locators um, it's a one-to-one, -one. so the process, the workflow, everything else. So let me just really quickly, before I open up Maya, explain a little bit of my workflow so there's some context to what you're about to see. Um, my workflow process is built on basic Maya concepts that are modular and procedural. The tools I'll use for this demo are simple locators, constraints, and IK that any animator with a basic knowledge of Maya can duplicate. You can go back to your computer after this and you could replicate exactly what I'm doing here. I create my script simply by recording my steps, cleaning up the calls that are too specific, and making buttons on the shelf. Um, really nothing fancy going on here, but by working this way, I have direct control over my character, and I'm free to alter any aspect of my rig for whatever I'm doing. If I'm doing a backflip, I can convert the rig to do that. If I'm grabbing an object in the world, I can convert the rig to fit that. Um, I'm not limited by anything. Um, I'll do my best to illustrate the process as I work, but I don't have enough time to go into the depths of this topic here. Fortunately, in my iAnimate class, shameless plug, I cover this topic in more detail. So let me uh, kill the presentation real quick so I can bring Maya up. Should only take a moment. And this is the part that I was worried about. Let's see. Let's see if I should be. I guess I shouldn't. It worked. Yes! All right. So we're in Maya, and we can move stuff around, and it's live. And say hi. <laughs> All right. So you'll notice that this is Lisa. This is our iAnimate character. If you take our games class, this is one of the characters you'll get to animate on. Um, she, right now, is just bones. Um, there's no rig. There's no nothing here. It's just bones. So any animator would look at this and say, well, I can't, I can't do anything until I have a rig. But you can. You can animate those bones. Not exactly ideal, though. So instead of working on every little bit of the character separately, you know, trying to select those bones and everything, I've got these little scripts here that I made. And like I said, I can't go into too much detail on them, but I'll break at least one of them down for you. Um, where I can apply IK in the arms, on the legs, and on the spine. And these just generate over the existing bones. Now, the cool thing is I could have been animating that character. Let me show you that real quick. I could animate this character using this rig. Let's just throw down a few keys here. And she's going to look up all hopeful. Because she's hopeful, right? Yes, I'm hopeful. All right, sweet. All right, let's lean her in more. OK, cool. We've got this animation where she kind of, what? Yeah, we're good, all right? Yeah, let's do this. So let me show you a cool trick I could do. Let's, um, let's say I want to work a little bit more on the bones. Because if you notice here, um, one thing I should probably point out is when I rotate her head up and down, look at the way it's rotating. It's not actually controlling just the head. It's controlling the neck. It's controlling a little bit of the shoulder area. Whenever I look around with this character, 
it creates natural looking poses, right? So I don't have to worry about lots and lots of controls and lots and lots of keys to get that from here up to look natural. Anything I do is on that one control object. I have X, Y, and Z rotation. That's it. So when I'm animating, I'm animating a lot less data, right? Um, animating quickly is important in the gaming industry for those of you who have ever been in it. I think you guys are all struggling to get a, a 24 hour game out today. Animating quickly, very important, right? So if you look at the chest, I'll just show you one last thing. You know, the chest distributes the rotation down the spine. Um, anything I do here is actually redistributed back down the spine. And then the hips are the same way. You know, I could do that, and it's just controlling the general posture of the spine. And then the hips move independently. Um, so let's say I want to control the direct bones, or I want to control in a more refined approach. Like I want to just rotate here, this one. This one looks pretty, right? Yeah, that's, that's a good one. I'm just going to control that one, okay? Let's do it. That rig's gone. Um, where's my hypergraph? Let me bring up my hypergraph. Windows, hypergraph hierarchy. Oh, it did the same thing. <laughs> yeah, the curse, it is back. All right, well, screw the hypergraph hierarchy for now. Let's see if I can get my window animation editor, graph editor at least, so you could see. Okay, so what it did was it plotted a bunch of curves down on a, you know, on a per frame basis. I could control that when I bake. You know, I can have different settings that bake just the keys I set. That's easy to do. Or I could just go in and find keys and sh sh gone. It's just, it's easy to work this way. Baking down makes it so I don't have to counter animate. And let me tell you, cleaning up a curve, that took me two seconds. Counter animating, hours. I'd much rather work like this. All right, so let me uh, talk a little bit about a run cycle now. So I'm going to piggyback a little bit off of Cameron. Um, he had an amazing talk on references. Um, this is a step when you really want to listen to him. You need to make a run cycle. You need to start making content for that awesome navigation system I just showed, right? And um, you need to start somewhere. You, know, you start with your first clip. The reason I like to start with a run forward when I'm making navigation systems like this is because design likes to set um, a speed. So a designer will come to me and they'll say, our character could run, you know, six meters a second. You know, so, so, all right, now I know my constraints. My max speed when I'm pushing up on that stick is six meters a second, right? So I could put a locator on my scene from zero to 30, have it go six meters, and then I just match my character to that. Really simple. Um, but even though I have the speed, I really don't know what it needs to look like. So exactly what Cameron said, do that now, okay? So figure out your run, break it down, really understand what your run is going to look like. Don't start yet, just understand what it's gonna look like. You have your data, you're gonna have your visuals once you do that workflow, and then you can actually start Maya. So much like Cameron mentioned, um, coming up with that image in your head. What is the image of your run? What is that core feature of the run that you really want to illustrate? Well, that is your starting pose, right? So in this situation, I have my starting pose. I'm going to make it full screen. I have my starting pose, and I have my speed. Now, a couple things I should explain about this. The, and you can see my mouse, cool. So this forward lean in the run, that's important, because the further you push up on the stick, the more you want that character to lean into where they're going, right? So if you're doing a walk, you can pretty much keep it straight up. And as you run, you get down more and more, All right? This way, the player is directly controlling. They're directly influencing that world. It's subconscious. They're never going to notice that. But they're going to feel it in their gameplay, right? Since as a first-person shooter, you have a gun up all the time. You know, it's like, hey, Rick, how's it going? Don't be intimidated. You know, it's, it's fine. I've got a gun in your face. But in third person, you need to match that, right? So um, you can't have third person running down like this while your first person's running like this because there's a disconnect. And people, like if you're playing a match against somebody, and you see someone running around like this, and then all of a sudden they shoot you from this pose, it's like, wait, they weren't even aiming at me. So you have to have your character aiming in your run cycles in a first person shooter. That's why she's doing this right now. 
Um, so I can actually export this file, and I could test it in game. And I can give it to my design team, and I could say, what do you think? Do you like the speed? Do you like the general idea of the run? Is there anything you'd want to change? And they, of course, want to change everything at least five times. So um, I make those changes, we iterate, and um, we come up with a good speed, and we come up with a good general posture. Next step, I guess some more poses in there. And I'll explain a little bit of what I'm thinking about with some of these poses so you can... Oh, that's because i got a locked camera. Hang on. Well, it's got a camera one. Yeah, butt shot. That's good. All right. So here you can see I'm just doing my loop frame and my middle frame. And this is just to essentially pose out the extents, the biggest change in the motion itself. Um, the reason I like to start with the foot, with the weight on the foot for my loop frame is it's an easy point to go down and push off into. So if you're standing there, you know, doing this, and you need to go into a run, it'll, just by pressing forward, it'll naturally go down and then into the run, right? It feels like you've got anticipation built in, even though you don't. So that's why I start on that frame. Another quick thing is I like drawing lines throughout the body. I like finding good curves. I like coming up with ways to, to essentially mimic those curves. The more similarities you could see in lines of action in your, in your pose, the more it reinforces the image in somebody's head. Usually people will only remember, like it, usually it takes 10 to 15 frames of an animation for someone to actually register that image in their head. They're not going to see the motion, they're just going to register that image. They're going to walk away remembering it. I think Cameron talked a little bit about that. So what I want to do is come up on a, on a looping cycle that is 18 frames long with common themes, common lines of action, common imagery. So when they, they think about it in their mind, they're taking away my general idea. The motion is just to sell the weight. So. Let me show you a different camera angle real quick. Boom. So yeah, the opposite. I just put a little bit of change in there. I mean, obviously, it's a big change from behind. From the side, it's not too much. So what's important here is getting those poses right. Because if you don't, the foundation of your house, uh, the rest of the house is going to fall down around it if your foundation's not right. And this is further revision. So. A lot more posing went in here. Um, I got all my sub poses. And essentially, when I pose is when there's a big change happening. Like the character's pushing off with a leg, the character's hitting the ground with a leg, the passing position, stuff like that. I key changes. I don't just arbitrarily key in fours or eights, like Cameron said. I key essential changes. The rest of it will kind of work itself out. So here you can see the run from the side. One quick thing I should point out here. Um, when people run, like you really have to understand the anatomy of the body, right? To get a good run cycle. You just don't want a character puppeting around, because I don't want to I don't want my avatar to make me feel like I'm Pinocchio running around this game. The character's got to feel like a real life human. It's got to have the same constraints that a human body has. In this situation, you notice how the knee comes forward and then the leg swings out, then it plants. It's actually how people run. So when you're animating a character rig, you're going to know that you, know, you have your hip motion, you have your foot motion, and then this in between is, God help it, it's IK, whatever it's going to do, it's going to do, right? So a lot of times you get animation that has knee pop crazy, you know, as the foot does nice arcs and all this kind of crazy stuff. Um, your knees are so important to your run cycle. If your knees don't feel physical and you let IK just bend you over like that, it's never going to work out well. I should edit that one out. <laughs> All right. So the next step is, um, let me make it full screen here. Panel perspective. I'm good at that one. That's good. I mumble a lot when I animate. All right. So now it's time to tween. And by the way, let me let me say this one thing before really getting too much into this. Your core poses have to be right. You have to answer every single question, probably in your planning process. But if you can't in your planning process, they have to be answered before your core pose out's done. So if you're still wondering how I'm going to work through some of these poses, you're not done with your core poses. You've got you to really push them through because that's where your exploration should be, and that's where you should really get it nailed down. Your tween should just be making it look sweet. Your tween shouldn't be the, how do I do this run, right? So by this point, 
Uh, let, let me just show how many poses I had in there. Let's just take a second. I'm skipping around here. So, suck my rig. Okay, so, so you could see the foot, the weight over the foot, the push off, the passing, or when the foot is about to plant, the plant itself, and then the, the passing push off again. Um, it's important to get as much as you can in the pose out, right? Oh, not save as. What am I doing? Head breaking. Need more apple. All right. Here we go. And one is all right. Anyway, next step, I work on my spine, specifically the hips. I try and get the hips right. Um, that motion needs to be, because essentially the hips are, it's it's the area that distributes the rest of the motion. I mean, your your feet hit the ground and they distribute it up to the hips. But the hips are what controls everything else in the body, not only from a rig perspective, but from a physicality perspective. You're compensating. Like when a character, when, when a real person, like when you see people walk around this conference out here, notice when they walk, the most stable part of their body is their head. People compensate. People have learned over many generations and many evolutionary cycles to essentially keep that head where they perceive the world as steady as humanly possible. So. If you're doing this and your head's all around, you just, you're going to run into walls. You just, no one's going to date you. It's going to look terrible, right? <laughs> um, the reason I'm saying that is because the hips need way more motion than your head. So I try and get the hips right. I try and get those to have a lot of motion in it, a lot of weight, a lot of power. I distribute it up the spine. So uh, window animation editors. Graph editor, yay, it worked too. So you can see I'm still roughly on my core posing, but I've offset a lot. So my up and my down, let's see, that's not the right up and the down. I probably put it on a different object, which is in my, let's see if this works. Hypergraph hierarchy, it didn't work. It's gone. All right, screw it. Maybe I could do it like that. Oh. It's right there. Hello. How's it going? All right. So I actually made a, a real quick separate object to control my translation. So you could see I really focused a lot on the up and the down. Got that right. The side to side, I got that feeling the way I wanted it to. And the lunge and the lag of the hips, forward and back. When you push off, the hips go forward. When you plant, they go back a little bit and forward. It's very subtle, though. And the reason I actually created this separate object is because I wanted to make the hips relative to his linear forward direction. So this way, instead of seeing one big line going forward to try and get that subtle variation in my forward and back, I made it a child of my linear navigation. So any forward and back lag, I could directly see in my graph editor without all that forward crap going on. So let me go to the side view. You can see it real quick. And then I'll keep going because I'm running late. So you can see she's pushing. You know, you could see the, the, the abdomen muscles. You could feel the back muscles working in this. One of the reasons I, I like to work with locators is I'm looking at a ma uh, character mesh. I'm not looking at a rig. And it's important for me to actually look at my character when I animate as opposed to looking at my rig when I animate. Because essentially the player is going to look at my character. They're not going to see a rig. All right. Oh, this thing. Cool trick. Um, what I like to do is I like to make a locator that's a child of my forward navigation direction, essentially a child of that linear, you know, start, stop from the end of the frames. And what I do is I make it a, a, a child, or I constrain it to the, the hip side to side. So this way I got the locator, which is up here, moving side to side with the hips, right? I then bake it down and just drop the curve down by about 60%. Now I've got a little bit of side to side here, much less than the hip motion I've got going on. This is probably a great video. Uh, <laughs> and then what I could do is I could actually animate my spine to match my head to that object. Now, I don't want my head going forward and back in space as I run because then it's, that's, you know, you're, you know, we're not birds. So, so when you actually see her run, her nose is rubbing up and down on that locator. Um, and then from behind, you can see the side to side, and her nose is lined up with that locator. So 
It keeps all that weight. It keeps that compensation up the body. All right, I'm spending too much time on this. Got to keep going. I was on four, right? Yeah. Next step is to get the feet right. And I'll talk a little bit about the... Oh, let's do it from this angle because it's better. I'll talk a little bit about... Get rid of that rig. So now that the spine's right, I work a little bit on the feet. Again, what I was saying about the leg, bring the knee out, swing the rest of it, plant. Um, a push-off, a good push-off, is a roll from the ball of the foot. Um, the cool way about working like this is you could set your rig up to work from the ball of your foot, or you could remove it and then reapply it to work from the heel of your foot. It's essentially wherever you want that point to be, you just essentially control it from there. One set of curves. You don't have a bunch of sliders in an attribute window saying, well, if you want to roll like this, use this slider, but this is this slider, and then where are your keys? You have tons of keys working in all these different sliders, and it's really hard to tell in your graph editor what's going on. If you actually just bake down and change your pivot point and then reapply your rig, that's just six, you know, X, Y, Z, rotation, translation. Done. You just control that. You walk away. It's easy. Uh, see it from behind real quick. All right, sweet. Six, yeah. I don't know why I kept it on that camera perspective, because I never liked it. All right, so here I did a little bit of work on the arms, which you can't see from that angle. So here's the thing. I didn't animate those arms. I yanked that animation straight out of the body. It was already there. All I did was I made a locator out where the gun is. I made that locator constrained to the shoulder using a maintain offset, and I baked it down. This is where I got this, right? Once I had that, I constrained that locator to drive the gun, and then I offset it in time. I didn't have to animate it. It was already done. It's already in the animation. In less than a minute, I got gun animation. And I got this other cool trick that I like to do. I like to then take another locator, just put it out in front of the gun somewhere. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. And then I like to constrain that to the gun. So this is whatever the gun's doing, that locator's doing. Bake it down and then I aim the rotation of the gun at it, and then I offset that in time. So you can see here, I don't have to animate anything. It's all there. I'm just moving stuff around. So no keys were set in the making of that gun animation. All right, let's see. The last step I like to do is just polish it, you know? Find some objects in there that aren't working, make them work. Like the sword on her back wasn't working before. So I gave it a little bit of offset. Same trick. Locator, maintain offset where the pivot point of the sword is. Had it constrained to the chest, baked it down, reverse the constraint, offset it in time, cleaned up the curves. Um, the bob on the hair, aim constraint. Same trick with the gun, right? I don't have to animate any of that because it's already built into my animation. I'm just moving things around. That's all I'm doing. This animation here, um, let's see, there's that perspective, that perspective, this perspective, four and a half hours. Why is that important? Why is four and a half hours important? Well, I work in the gaming industry. Um, if you work in the gaming industry, you know that there are tight deadlines and that um, essentially you have productions to get out, out of the building. With a game like Destiny, you're making thousands of animations, literally thousands of animations to get this game out the door. So if you figure you have a team of 10 guys, you have thousands of animations to make, how many of that is it, you know, how many animations is that a day? It's more than one. You know, it's, it's more than one a week, I can tell you that. So you've got to be quick. 